All right, everyone, welcome back. It's uh, 1040 and we're back from our break. Um, you're back here with the Sierra Club talking about sea level rise adaptation in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, our next speaker is Luisa Valiela from the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, Luisa, um, welcome. Thank you for being here with us. And the floor is yours. So uh, I've been invited to, to go over um, a kind of a recent addition to uh, the, the very strong um, history that we have in the Bay Area on solving problems through partnerships. So I'm going to be speaking about the Bay Regulatory um, Integration Team, the Bay Restoration Regulatory Integration Team. We call it BRIT. Um, we're, we're a government agency effort, so of course we acronymed ourselves. Um, so the, the previous panel um, really set the stage kind of nicely in terms of, you know, we, we know that the science and the consensus has been building about restoring wetlands um, to address sea level rise. We're already, you know, a little bit behind. Um, the sooner the better. Um, there, that, that has been um, building and I'd say it's safe to say that there's consensus in the Bay Area. Um, that we want to be building these restoration projects um, now and faster. We need funding for that. Um, an incredible amount of effort has been spent on putting in place um, a, a variety of different funding sources for that work. But there was another kind of leg to the stool, um, having science and funding. These projects still require permitting. Um, and the permitting was, was uh, also kind of universally acknowledged. Um, as an issue that can add too much time um, and too much cost to projects. And when the restoration authority um, was stood up and the partnerships that were put in place for Measure AA, um, you know, multi-year effort, um, the, those that had worked on those efforts kind of pivoted um, to addressing this, this, uh, this other problem, um, the permitting um, issue. So that is where we found ourselves in about 2017. Um, in, in terms of uh, thinking outside the box, this has also been mentioned today, um, and, and starting a, a regulatory integration team. Um, we didn't always call it that, but that's what we ended up calling it, um, with all of these agencies um, involved. So BRIT is expressly um, set up to improve the permitting process for multi-benefit habitat restoration projects. Um, these are projects that through the restoration authority, you know, whose first aim really is to address restoration, wetlands restoration in the Bay. Um, but obviously they're being built with a lot of other uh, multi-benefits in mind, um, flood protection and public access, for instance. Um, so the BRIT does involve all of these agencies, the Corps of Engineers, Fish and Wildlife Service, EPA, and NOAA Fisheries at the federal family level. And then at the state level, uh, the Bay Conservation and Development Commission, uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the, the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board. So as I said, we, we began in earnest um, in 2017 as, as part of a planning um, effort. Um, there, there was a lot of legwork um, in terms of creating a functional um, setup for involvement, um, certainly wanting all stakeholders that wanted to be involved um, to be involved. Um, we, we had to address the fact that we needed to have an agency level team that looked at permits, but also involve all of the agencies um, higher up the management chain. And so Brit actually, although we use that term usually to refer to the permitting team itself. Um, we also have a policy and management committee that is another level up in all of these agencies to address kind of longstanding um, policy conflicts that, that do exist um, when it comes to permitting projects. So our policy and management team, our committee stood up in 2018. Um, and then an, a, another enormous level of legwork was spent in terms of finding funding to pay um, for the BRIT team. Policy and Management Committee is essentially each agency's commitment in kind to be part of this process. Um, but the, the dedicated staff people, and I will emphasize that essentially we're investing in people just like all of our other challenges really do involve engaging with people and taking the time um, to get input from people. 
Um, we needed to find funding to fund the agency staff, this dedicated staff that would work in an integrated way um, for the projects. So time was spent finding that funding. The Restoration Authority provided the first amount of funding, followed by other stakeholders um, that we'll have a slide um, to show um, all the other contributing funders as well that contribute to making sure that we have this five-year pilot project paid for um, and already have some acknowledged uh, cost savings that um, have us pretty comfortably probably going beyond 2024 um, in terms of being able to continue to fund the BRIT. Um, and this timeline also just kind of shows um, how we are tracking our, our progress, the amount of projects that have been um, put into the permitting phase. Um, the BRIT team itself has a very intense, uh, uh, detailed database that, that is behind um, this timeline that, that enables them to track all of the projects that they have um, on their workload. So funding the BRIT costs about uh, $1.2 million a year. Um, that is for six agency staff. EPA um, is not receiving funding, although participates on the BRIT team as an ad hoc member. Um, but for all the other six federal and state agencies, um, this amount of funding pays for their salary. So beyond the Restoration Authority, the Bay Area Toll Authority, Santa Clara Valley Water District, East Bay Parks, and the Coastal Conservancy, um, they make up the other $600,000 um, that basically matches the Restoration Authority's um, first outlay of the $600,000 to make the $1.2 million a year um, whole. These are our current uh, BRIT members. Um, and just to, to emphasize, they're all extremely talented and have been experienced in their agencies uh, working on wetlands restoration project permitting. Um, and they are really bringing their expertise to the team and, and learning about each other within their agency frameworks, um, which we have all, we were, we're all hoping that that's the secret sauce um, for what you know, makes BRIT um, an exemplary effort, um, that the dedication of this staff and their ability to integrate and communicate with each other um, will benefit not only the BRIT projects, um, but but work towards culture change um, truly and and work its way through the systems um, that we have within our, our bureaucracy. Um, not pictured is Jen Siu um, from EPA as well who participates in an ad hoc basis with the BRIT team. So to um, give you a lot of numbers and again I hope the slides will be made available to you because I'm not gonna be able to go through this and I'm sure you're not gonna be able to read it all quickly either. Um, but the BRIT manages a pretty hefty workload, um, 18 projects right now. Um, we have four projects permitted. Um, there's, it's, you know, it's a rotating basis of, you know, meeting the projects that get put on the BRIT list. Um, the BRIT team then engages with them. They have kind of a, an onboarding meeting, an information sharing meeting, and then uh, the BRIT concept really is to engage really early, as early as possible with these projects um, in the design phase, and we call it the pre-application phase, um, not necessarily to be conflated with how the core defines the pre-app process. Um, this one is, is lengthier, but it is essentially, we want to spend as much time with project applicants as possible in um, vetting issues, sharing information, creating a feedback loop giving information and getting information back. And the BRIT um, is putting information and feedback in writing after talking about uh, projects at whatever phase they're in, um, back to the project applicants. And those can be iterative meetings, as many as is necessary to get to the point where a project really is ready to send in a permit application. And everyone agrees that the project is ready to send in their permit application so that the permit application timelines that each agency has, they are different, um, but that those timelines can be kept, that there would be no reason to put a hold or a delay on processing the permits because all of the issues have been resolved in the pre-application phase. The BRIT team um, has spent an extraordinary amount of time, especially in the first year, um, and we're about two years in really right now, um, in making a very useful website with as many resources as possible. Um, if you haven't already gone to the BRIT website, I encourage you to do so. It is helpful. It is loaded with information, um, with requests for how information should come to the BRIT, how to um, get a contact um, in BRIT. And um, 
and then when you're in the process, um, some model tools uh, for you know what what permit conditions might look like, um, things like that. Um, so we are two years in, but um, it, it's still a learning process and probably will continue to be. Um, these are complex projects. They are they are coming to us with what we assume are going to be issues um, that need attention and. In the first phase, in the first year um, of BRIT, we certainly continued to encounter that, especially the projects that had to be permitted that did not have the benefit of early engagement with BRIT. Um, so there was some, some pressure um, on, on those projects. We certainly wanted to give them attention, um, but they, they were, there was a little bit of a pressure cooker um, in terms of wanting to get them permitted and still having to work through all these uh, inherent agency conflicts that do exist. Um, so we are, we're just trying to stay as open as possible to getting feedback from the project uh, proponent community, um, whether you're in the BRIT process or not. If you've heard about someone else who was in the BRIT process and you have questions about that, um, there are multiple ways to, to engage and get answers. And, and that's what we're, we're trying to do. The, the website itself also just has a lot of contact information if there are questions. Um, I will stress that uh, even in the early days, um, there were improvements based on feedback received from project applicants that the letters that they were getting from the BRIT weren't as coordinated um, or integrated as, as a project proponent would want. Um, the BRIT really took that to heart and has been improving that process um, so that in the, the first, um, after you've had your first meeting, with the BRIT on a project, um, the letter that goes back to you with questions or uh, our options for resolving issues, um, the BRIT has really uh, improved um, that letter, letter back. Um, this is just to highlight the policy and management committee. They do meet monthly. Um, they are the, the home of the permit and policy improvement list. So, there's a certain amount of dedication that, that the BRIT obviously does on a per project basis to resolving issues, but inevitably we'll find issues and we can sometimes even predict them ahead of time that are really these kind of higher level policy conflicts. Um, and they are identified on a list that is part of our performance measures to the Restoration Authority and to the other funders. Um, on how we're doing, um, how the agencies at a higher level, if necessary, at a, you know, a manager level, um, how do we interpret policy differently or, or suggest that policies be changed or what does need to go to the legislature? The, the, the problems that, are, that need those types of uh, resolutions are identified in this permit and policy improvement list. And there's a commitment on an annual basis to start to address them. Some of them obviously won't be able to be addressed by the PMC itself because some of them probably will have to land at the, the, the hands or the laps of the legislature or, or potentially even Congress, um, but, but it's being uh, documented and there's a commitment to kind of document that process and that thinking process, the attempt to identify an issue and a resolution. Um, so that is the... Uh, certainly the commitment that the policy and management committee makes every time that it meets um, to work through that list, as well as address any other issues that the BRIT team itself has raised to its attention. How do you get on the BRIT project list? Definitely um, an important uh, uh, process to cover. Um, there is an actual um, request right now. It is sent um, by Amy Hutzel at the Coastal Conservancy on a semi-annual two times a year um, basis. Um, requests to be put for your project to be put on the BRIT list, um, you, you basically answer that call um, and submit it through email and it is screened by the Restoration Authority staff to be qualified as a Restoration Authority project. Um, so if you feel like you are missing those emails, um, please feel free to let me know. I will definitely just be forwarding your email to Amy Hutzel. So if you need Amy Hutzel's contact info, um, I can certainly provide that to you as well. Um, but that is, um, that is our process currently for uh, making sure that we have a current, um, that we're attending essentially to the current requests from the restoration community um, to see if they qualify for, for attention by BRIT. 
Um, we are requ we are requiring essentially for projects that are on the Brit list to also be uh, cataloged and screened on Eco Atlas as a way to really help do regional tracking and regional sharing of information. What you can expect from Brit, uh, I've probably touched on a number of things already. Um, these pre-application meetings are, are basically, we want to be uh, client friendly, user friendly. Um, so you, you, get, you get everyone's attention. Um, you have as many meetings as is necessary, but you do have to come prepared um, for those meetings. Um, you will get feedback from the Brit, both verbally and in writing. Site visits, always a key part of understanding a project. Um, COVID certainly impacted um, the Brit team's ability to get out in the field, but that is changing in the last uh, month or so. Um, that's going to start to be more available again, which will be great. Um, and and Brit also, you know, recognizes and shares information with um, the projects that are on their list. That if they run up against an issue that really can't be resolved um, by the Brit team, that 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 issue or, or elevation to the PMC is an option that's available to them. As I mentioned, what Brit needs from um, a project or a project proponent um, is organized information and they provide really good guidance on how to present or provide that information to the Brit so that it can be digested by them um, and, and feedback, a feedback loop can be established. Um, when it comes time to actually get that, that project to its uh, application phase, um, there will be a kind of reminders about what a complete application should be, attachments that are required, fees that are required, um, so it, it will be a very mutual, uh, mutual process. As I said, Brit has really, um, all of us, you know, both at the PMC and at the Brit level, you know, we know this is, this is a hard thing to do. Um, it's a really exciting thing to do and to be trying to really um, service the restoration community, but with, you know, really ingrained bureaucratic problems. Um, so we, we, we know that there needs to be a lot of, uh, a lot of feedback, willingness to accept feedback. Um, and so we have, we have set that kind of um, system up. I have a couple more slides just to um, circle back to the, the funding question, just to ensure that um, people know that, um, that we have a program um, that's run through EPA throughout my office um, for the San Francisco Bay Water Quality Improvement Fund. These are four water quality and wetlands restoration projects at a tune of about $5 million a year, but that has been changing quickly and drastically um, with new attention from Jackie Spears office. Um, the San Francisco um, Water Bay Water Quality Improvement Fund um, really had been shepherded by Senator Feinstein for many, many years, um, but now there's um, even a, a stronger effort by both um, the House and the Senate with Spears' um, attention to increase the amount um, that this, this grant fund is getting um, through EPA um, and may actually, um, one minute, gotcha, um, may um, grow into another program office where we can even get more resources, much like the Restoration Authority did with Measure AA. We hope that a geographic program does get established um, to, to increase the amount of federal funding that can come to these types of projects. So this is just our website um, off of EPA's website, just so you know, if you are interested in this grant fund and don't already know about it, these are, um, this is just a quick map um, that shows projects that we have. This is just a pie chart showing the amount of funds that have been invested over time. And, and this it harkens back to questions that were um, talked about earlier, which is emphasis on disadvantaged communities, which we absolutely um, have been doing, not from the beginning, but certainly um, as being part of this, this arc of attention that needs to be paid attention to in the last few years, we have added this, um, this emphasis. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you. Louisa, thank you so much. Uh, ex fascinating uh, stuff. And, and uh, you know, I did not know that all that was happening, actually. So that's great. Uh, if we can start connecting some of these dots uh, between the players that are involved. Really appreciate it. All right. Our next speaker is James Muller from the San Francisco Estuary Partnership. And uh, James, I'm going to hand it over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, my name is James Muller. I'm the principal environmental planner for the San Francisco Estuary Partnership. 
Uh, I manage the Bay Area's Integrated Regional Water Management Grants, which currently include 46 different projects. Um, and within that grant program, I'm also working with a team, including Josh, who we heard from earlier, uh, to engage disadvantaged communities and tribes across the region to conduct water needs assessments and to develop projects to meet those needs. I am pleased to be with you all today. Um, and I'll be providing a bit of insight into some strategies to ease the funding challenge here in the Bay Area. I'll be focusing my presentation today on two core components, uh, funding opportunities and the role partnerships will play in achieving our goals. Uh, I don't think it's uh, you know, a, a surprise to anyone here attending that we have some, some really critical funding needs uh, here in the Bay Area. And, and hopefully today will give us a little bit of insight into how we might uh, uh, ease that funding gap. So um, over the past three weeks, this webinar series has explored climate change and sea level rise and nature-based solutions, but I'd like to provide a bit of context to set the stage for this presentation. Uh, we are the fifth largest metro area in the nation with over 7.5 million residents in nine counties across 101 cities with 250,000 of those residents living on the shoreline. Uh, using the USGS data published by the Our Coast, Our Future project, uh, Baykeeper used FEMA's HAZIS model to help examine the risk imposed by various levels of sea level rise, plus the added risk of significant storm. That valuated risk was between 45 and $100 billion. Over the next 80 years, we stand to lose billions of dollars to replace and repair residential, industrial, transportation, and other assets in the Bay Area. Assets at risk include the 101 in Larkspur, the 580 in San Rafael, SR 37, the Capital Corridor Rail Line in Martinez, SR 92 and US 101 in Foster City, airports, ports, wastewater infrastructure, and the Bay Trail. Uh, and that's a very short list of, of our assets at risk. And nature-based solutions are really needed to increase the resilience to the efforts of climate change and to sea level rise. Uh, in addition to the site-specific improvements, habitat, wildlife benefits, that multi-benefit adaptation approaches provide, nature-based solutions can increase tidal prisms, uh, create opportunities for ecosystems to adapt and migrate, uh, and to absorb tidal and storm energy, which will reduce erosion in the Bay Area. Uh, there are two considerations we need to spend a bit of time um, with as we discuss the funding challenge today. Uh, getting the funding for projects is the only way we're gonna get them built. Uh, ideally, this will happen in a strategic and coordinated manner here in the Bay Area while simultaneously exploring opportunities to reduce the costs of solutions we need to implement. We'll get into the funding discussion, but I do want to address cost reduction. Uh, there are several ideas out there that could bring down the price tag for climate resilience strategies, uh, and those should be pursued. Um, you know, where the price tag is big as we've got, um, we, we really need to take advantage of those when, when we can. And while we have some significant funding opportunities currently and on the horizon, uh, the scope of the problem is going to require the region to burn the candle at both ends. Ideas like strategic placement for existing baylands, hydraulic dredging to offset beneficial reuse costs, installing LID features as part of integrated street and sidewalk maintenance schedules, and other ideas are rising to the surface and must be considered, studied, and where it makes sense, pursued. The critical nature of climate change demands that we find these opportunities and pursue them with gusto. And I would be remiss, um, we are talking about funding and there's a lot of competing priorities here. Um, and it, I would be remiss if I didn't note that ensuring equity and environmental justice priorities remain at the core of our climate resilience strategy should be um, a, a top priority for all restoration efforts. We collectively need to ensure the communities we are working so hard to protect and the tribes who've stewarded this land for thousands of years are engaged and able to inform projects in their areas. Uh, this is not inexpensive and it is not simple work uh, and it should not be sacrificed as we work to meet the region's funding needs. Measure AA is a perfect example of the interdependency between funding restoration efforts and act actively engaging Bay Area communities. All right, so I, I do want to say I feel really heartened after hearing Assemblyman Mullen's breakdown of funding opportunities at the state level, and I would like to echo his enthusiasm for the renewed federal support and initiative around addressing the impacts of climate change and sea level rise. Today, I'm hoping to provide some thought on avenues in which our region can advocate for increased and more inclusive funding streams. The magnitude of the need here in the Bay Area means that we need to support our representatives at all levels as they work to help us address climate change. First, 
Local funding efforts like Measure AA are certainly going to play a role in our future. However, it is very doubtful that we'll ever be able to meet the vast funding needs to adapt to climate change going it alone. These opportunities, however, can play important roles in meeting match requirements for state and federal sources of funding. It is also worth noting that it was a block of interested Bay Area agencies, nonprofits, and regulators that worked together and played important roles to achieve the passage of this measure with over 70% approval from Bay Area residents, demonstrating the power of organization and public communication. The San Francisco Bay Area has a lot of political power in Sacramento, and that's on full display this month as the governor's budget is being finalized and a $75.5 billion surplus is being considered. Uh, leveraging our collective voices to communicate our needs to the state is going to be an important part of getting the funding we need to protect our region. Cutting the Green Tape Initiative is a great example of how local leaders here in the Bay Area can work with state legislators to help define barriers to successful adaptation to sea level rise and climate change that need to be resolved and strategies to address them. This type of engagement will require partnership and collaboration. It is, it is also important to advocate for language in state legislation, bonds, and programs that make funding more inclusive for marginalized communities and tribes. This includes advocating for eligible costs to compensate community and tribal members for their time, um, as well as including eligible costs for childcare and food, um, which Josh alluded to earlier. While the region's funding needs may seem daunting, uh, we must ensure that we pursue funding solutions that allow for this type of engagement. Federal funding opportunities are gonna be anybody's guess, to, to be honest. With four-year cycles, um, you know, administrations can, can swing wildly um, in terms of their support and funding for these programs uh, and for these initiatives. And depending on the administration, opportunistic engagement may be the strategy we need to employ to get more direct funding into the region to implement, implement more nature-based multi-benefit projects. Currently, we're fortunate to have an administration that not only believes in climate science, but is willing to commit to funding to help communities across the US adapt to its impacts. We should continue advocating for the federal at the federal level for increased funding, but there are existing programs that we can engage. We just heard from Louisa, uh, who manages one of the most well-known programs here in the San Francisco Bay area um, that's funded many projects, the San Francisco Bay Water Quality Improvement Fund. Uh, it's funded projects, scientific studies, outreach efforts, um, uh, many of them uh, addressing climate change and sea level rise directly. In the following presentation, you'll hear from Allison uh, with FEMA, who will be going over the BRIC program, um, which, have, which will have some very substantial levels of funding. Shifting mindsets in federal agencies resulting from active engagement at the local and regional level have resulted in funding programs that are starting to align more closely with the immediate needs of coastal communities working to tackle climate change and sea level rise. Uh, the BRIC program specifically relies on hazard mitigation plans to direct this funding. So ensuring our region is positioned with those plans in place um, and, and to be competitive in these federal programs will be crucial to easing the funding gap that we currently have. I'd also like to note that there are several funding programs that, direct, that directly reference uh, the San Francisco Estuary Partnership and its Estuary Blueprint, and I'll touch on that shortly. Uh, so I want to share a bit about the San Francisco Estuary Partnership. We are an EPA place-based program uh, who is collaborative and non-regulatory. Uh, we were created to leverage federal, state, and regional resources uh, to support local projects and initiatives to protect, enhance, and restore the estuary. Uh, we're housed in the Association of the Bay Area Governments, this region's uh, coalition of governments responsible for land use and housing planning. Uh, as a result of a partial merge in 2017, we are employees of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, who's responsible for planning uh, transportation for the region. Uh, so we have a lot of regional connections and being housed here with ABAG and MTC have um, a great deal of opportunity. Uh, we were created in the early 90s after the San Francisco estuary earned its lofty designation of an estuary of national significance. There are 28 of these estuaries around the US and three in California, including Morro Bay Santa Monica, and Santa Monica Bay. Our planning area includes the watersheds that drain into the bay and extends pretty far into the Delta. We assist in implementing projects and initiatives that range from Sacramento to south of San Jose. The estuary partnership is guided by the estuary blueprint. It's technically called the Comprehensive Conservation and Management Plan, but we've lovingly rebranded it to the blueprint. It was created in 1993 and updated in 2000, 2007 and in 2016. 
We're currently undergoing an update and plan to have the newest version done by the end of this year or early 2022. The SRA Blueprint is a collaborative effort to define our short-term tasks and milestones we need to achieve to meet our long-term goals and actions. Uh, these goals you can see to the right are living resources, water, stewardship, and resilience. The actions to address those goals um, address multiple uh, goals with each action, um, and there are 32 of those. Uh, the documents informed by a huge swath of the environmental community, disadvantaged communities, and tribes. It's updated every five years now, so it can be considered a living document. And essentially, the document's asking this question, where do we want to be in 2050, and what do we need to do in the next five years to get there? I mentioned the SRA Blueprint uh, and SFEP for, for two reasons, uh, funding opportunities and regional collaboration. We are one of few entities whose planning area includes the entire Bay Delta estuary, and as a federal program, we can be an asset to the region's funding strategy. We've been working with our regional partners for the past three decades and have long served the region by collaborating with local stakeholders in planning, funding, and implementation efforts across the estuary. Our implementation committee, our management body guiding our efforts, is composed of dozens of agency, nonprofit, and scientific entities. Our relationships with ABAG and MTC also provide us with opportunities to help inform other regional planning efforts like Plan Bay Area. As I mentioned in my previous slide, one of the SRA partnership's goals is to leverage funding, uh, federal funding to address the region's environmental challenges. Through the blueprint, the SRA partnership is an access point for various funding sources and can provide an ongoing opportunity to access federal dollars. I'd like to share a number of funding opportunities that directly reference the estuary blueprint. They all do so in slightly different ways, uh, but, but there is a through line here that funding programs are increasingly referencing the blueprint as a regional planning document that informs eligibility or competitiveness. The collaborative nature of the blueprint itself makes references, um, makes this reference within funding programs an opportunity for the region to set priorities that programs can then reference. And so I've uh, briefly mentioned the San Francisco Bay Water Quality Improvement Fund, which requires consistency with the blueprint. Uh, two other uh, federal programs here, uh, one funding program out of the US EPA going through Restore America's Estuaries, the Coastal Watershed Grant, which requires a letter of acknowledgement from the local nation national estuary program, which is SFEP. Uh, in the Restoration Authority, uh, it's, it's a local um, regional funding program. The blueprint is one of the regional plans that can be referenced when applying to these grants. Uh, and of course, uh, Spears' ongoing efforts, uh, she is truly a hero um, in uh, advocating for funding for the San Francisco Bay Area in language that I pulled directly from her bill, HR 610, uh, from the last legislative section or session rather said, projects, activities, and studies, including restoration projects and habitat improvements for fish, waterfowl, and wildlife that advance the goals and objectives of the estuary blueprint. Right. So over the past many years, regulatory agencies and land managers and public stakeholders have increasingly recognized that siloed approaches to environmental challenges are limiting our ability to expand beyond what has been envisioned it, into what can be possible. This trend needs to continue and needs to ensure environmental equity and justice are carried with it. Coordination is a marathon, it's not a sprint. These monthly, bi-monthly or quarterly meetings may bring about fatigue, but long-term coordination is critical to ensure we are strategic and efficient. I've seen benefits of such approaches at the project level with small dam, rest or dam removal projects in the North Bay to regional initiatives like the, the, the Wetlands Regional Monitoring Program. The Bay Area is fortunate to have many platforms for such coordination and cross-pollination, and we should continue to support those efforts and ensure they drive our work towards an ever more resilient Bay. The San Francisco Estuary Partnership through its Estuary Blueprint has worked over the past several decades to promote these regional efforts identify priorities and to implement projects to enhance, restore and protect the estuaries environments and communities. We haven't done this in a vacuum and we've worked alongside our regional partners. Our unique roles in national estuary program has allowed us to work with many stakeholders over the decades to get projects funded, launch region wide programs and advance research across an array of environmental fields and to plan for ongoing and ever changing environmental challenges and opportunities. In addition to the strategic planning benefits that such coordination will certainly yield, fostering partnerships also provides opportunity to pursue funding in a more efficient and competitive manner. 
To recap the information here, our funding challenges are great and we need to work together as a region to leverage our collective voices to advocate for funding across all levels of government. Partnerships and long-term coordination are gonna be key in achieving our goals of increasing resilience to climate change and sea level rise across jurisdictions and geographies. The San Francisco Estuary Partnership is a federal place-based program meant to collaborate and obtain funding to protect, enhance and restore the estuary and has a unique role to play in supporting the regional stakeholders efforts in, comb in combating climate change and sea level rise. And with that, I'd like to thank you so much for your time and I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you for all of that. Uh, we sure appreciate the info. And uh, I have a couple of questions uh, that I'm seeing for myself for the panel discussion. So Allison Kearns from FEMA, thank you for being here with us. And we're going to uh, kick you off early here so we can have a little bit more time for Q&A. Welcome and the floor is yours. Sounds good. Thank you. And hi, everybody. It's really nice to be here and to get to speak to you all. Um, like was mentioned, my name is Allison Kearns. I'm a risk analysis branch chief here at FEMA Region 9. FEMA as an organization is, is split into 10 different offices around the country. Uh, Region 9 is actually based out of Oakland, California. So I just wanted to go over really quickly um, FEMA's mission uh, in terms of hazard mitigation, because most people, when you hear about FEMA, you hear um, or you think response, recovery, you know, rescuing people off of roofs or, or giving out funding. We actually have an entire um, line item that is dedicated towards uh, risk reduction and have a full-time job if there was not a single disaster that ever happened. So the group that I work in is called a mitigation division, um, and we are organized into four branches that focus on risk analysis, floodplain management, um, grant funding for mitigation um, projects, and then also environmental and historic preservation. All of our jobs, all 50 or 60 people, which is about to grow to 80, focused full time on breaking the cycle of disaster damage, reconstruction, and repeated damage. We are trying to reduce the impact of the next disaster that's going to happen. And we know it works. Uh, I, I'm sure this is something folks have heard about. It was pretty big news maybe a year or two ago. Um, FEMA does a study every few years about um, how much money uh, we save when we spend money on hazard mitigation. I think when the study was done in the 90s, it said for like every dollar spent, we saved four. The latest study actually shows that on average for every dollar spent, um, we save six. And depending on the type of activity, it could actually go up. Um, if you use modern building codes and smart land use decisions, we actually save closer to $11 per dollar saved. So we know it works. And because we know that, FEMA has dedicated a lot of resources to getting out in front of a disaster and trying to buy down that risk before an, something happens. So that's what I'm here to talk to you guys about today. Um, I am sure everybody has heard about or has started to think about funding opportunities. Um, and specifically, this one has hit the news Frankly, it happened earlier this week, we had some pretty big news about the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program. FEMA, we actually have a handful of grant programs that we administer um, both pre and post disaster. Typically though, uh, over the past maybe 20 or so years, most of that money comes after a disaster, which is just so counterintuitive. Um, you know, we're not trying to buy down risk if the event has already happened. And unfortunately, that's where a lot of our money was coming from. The Disaster uh, Recovery Reform Act, or DRRA, I think it was 2018, um, actually enabled this new program, which was just funded for the very first time this past fiscal year. And it's called the Building Resilient Infrastructure Communities Program, or BRIC. And it takes 6% of all of the disaster costs that were spent across the entire country and puts it into a special pot of money that is going to be um, spent every year on pre-disaster mitigation. This is something that, while we've had other grant programs that have come pre-disaster, it's very dependent upon, you know, administrations or kind of congressional, you know, influences. This is actually a program now where there is a set funding amount an opportunity that we can actually plan for every year. And that's what makes this so exciting. Some of the priorities for this program, you know, again, this is about buying down risk. 
looking where we're, we're you know, susceptible to flooding, to drought, extreme heat, um, seismic risk, you name it. Trying to look for where that exists and, and put preventative measures in place. The priorities though for the BRIC program are really honing in on looking at large scale you know, public infrastructure projects that protect our community lifelines, that buy down risk and support um, nature-based solutions, which I know is gonna be something that's relevant to everybody here, um, and also focuses on climate resilience and adaptation. Again, we're also trying to focus on preventing risk before it occurs. So there's actually a really large onus and an emphasis on smart land use, building codes, um, and trying to make sure that we're building and using land in a safe way um, to keep people out of harm's way. So I'm going to spend the rest of the presentation kind of honing in on that, that priority and focusing on nature-based solutions um, and the funding that we have available for that. The thing that's so exciting for BRIC is nature-based solutions have actually been an eligible activity under all of our grant programs for many years. But this is the first time where we have a program where if you actually have a, a green project, something that includes um, co-benefits and is focusing on the environment, this is actually something that puts you in a more competitive um, spot. This is where, you know, out of this nationally competitive program, you'll actually get more points um, for having nature-based solutions incorporated, which is the really exciting thing with BRIC. Um, so FEMA defines nature-based solutions as sustainable planning, design, environmental management, and engineering practices um, that incorporate or weave those natural features and processes into the built environment so we can be more resilient to the next disaster. Um, and we are, like I mentioned before, you know, FEMA, we're still funding those typical gray projects. We'll increase the size of a culvert. We will fund the building of a seawall, um, the hardening of a home. But we're really trying to um, address kind of this environmental justice lens um, and really acknowledge that we need to work with nature, not against it, to reduce the impacts of disasters. So this is the part where things are a little different and exciting is that we're prioritizing green over gray projects. Um, and the way that we're categorizing those are um, either watershed or landscape scale, neighborhood or site scale, and coastal areas. Um, so, you know, if it's a watershed or a landscape scale, those are things like wetland or floodplain restorations, um, looking at greenways. Um, for the neighborhood or site scales, um, FEMA will fund, you know, green roofs or um, permeable uh, surfaces, um, looking at rain barrels or things like that. And then for our coastal areas, FEMA will actually fund, um, you know, dune restoration, coral reef restoration, oil, or um, not oil, sorry, oyster reef restoration as well. Um, trying to look at those, those opportunities for, you know, reducing the impacts of waves or, um, you know, better uh, reducing, you know, the increasing temperatures and, and looking at opportunities for co-benefits um, across these different uh, kind of project types. The one thing though is with any federal grant, there are some, some pretty important eligibility criteria. And I go back to one of the first things that I said about um, you know, what our mitigation mission is. And it is about reducing the impact of the next disaster. It's about breaking that disaster cycle. Um, FEMA does focus, our, our primary focus is still on people and property and making sure that they are safer from the next event. Um, there can always be co-benefits for, for environmental um, considerations, um, but the, the biggest thing is it must protect people um, and or property. And that's um, somewhere we just have to balance those two. Um, it also must be cost effective. And this is the thing that's a little bit tricky, I think, with nature-based solutions is for FEMA's grant programs, um, we require a benefit cost analysis. So for every dollar spent, you must save at least $1. Um, so there's actually some methodology and, and toolkits that we have to do that, you know, looking at the entire cost of a project um, and then considering all of the money that would be saved in the long run. Um, when some of those benefits are environmental, that's tougher to quantify. 
Um, but there's actually a lot of new resources and guidance documents coming out or have just come out, um, I think even this week, about how to get over that hurdle and show how these nature-based solutions are cost-effective. It also, and I appreciate James, you, you making this plug, it does need to align with the hazard mitigation plan in your area. Um, this is one of the biggest kind of go, no go issues with our grants is you must have a approved hazard mitigation plan in order to apply and receive uh, grants. You know, this is something where actually in California, we're in a pretty good place. Most um, local cities, counties have approved mitigation plans, but this is something really important to consider uh, before we even think about funding. It must, your project must be in line with the latest um, international building codes. Um, and then also we must be in compliance with our, our national and federal um, environmental and historic preservation uh, requirements. So who's eligible? This past year, it was our very first year for BRIC. Um, and like with all of our mitigation grant funding, all of our state level governments are eligible. So that's our, our actual states. And then we've got about six, um, either territories or the District of Columbia that can also apply, are federally recognized tribes. In Region 9, we've got about 158 or so federally recognized tribes who are eligible to apply for this. And then also our local governments can apply. Um, and the cool thing is, you know, that's not just cities and counties or, or towns. Um, if you are a special district with, you know, a governing board and have local government and land use authority, we actually have a really strong presence of um, special districts who apply uh, and use mitigation funding here in Region 9. Um, also, other state agencies can apply as well. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, but the biggest thing is you must have an approved hazard mitigation plan to even kind of start with this. Um, and that's a really important component. So like I mentioned, this was the, um, the very first year that BRIC had, had come around. There was $500 million that were made available nationally. The application period closed in January. Their projects are currently being reviewed, ranked, and the announcements should be going out probably within the next couple of months about who's going to be getting those first round of, of funding. But the exciting and kind of um, overwhelming news is we actually got over $3 billion in requests, which just shows this overwhelming need for hazard mitigation across the entire country. There was $500 million available nationally in Region 9 alone, um, and that's California, Nevada, Arizona, Hawaii, um, and we also work with our Pacific Territory, so that's Guam, American Samoa, and the Northern Mariana Islands. From our seven state-level governments, uh, we actually received close to 600 million in requests. So in Region 9 alone, we could have surpassed the national budget. And obviously not everybody's going to get funded, um, but it just shows how ready we are to use this funding. Um, which is so exciting is because actually earlier this week, and I think it made kind of headline news, um, President Biden announced that $1 billion would be allocated towards this year's BRIC funding. Um, the notice of funding opportunity is actually going to be released probably within the next month or so. Um, and then the application period opens up in September. Um, the close of that will likely happen in January, and then projects will be selected next summer. The biggest thing I can say here for this, for everybody's awareness, is even though FEMA, you know, may be banking this program, the checks are written by our state governments. Um, if I go back here to applicant versus sub-applicant, um, it's really important to note that our state-level governments act as the applicant, and they help kind of facilitate all the sub-applicant um, applications that come through. So the reason I mentioned this is because even though FEMA might set deadlines and say applications, you know, you could start submitting them in September and um, the deadline is January, Almost all of our states, California included, has different deadlines. They'll actually ask for like a notice of interest um, announcement or, or solicitation. Um, that usually happens within a week or two after our application window opens up. So the, the moral of this story is start planning now. Um, the state deadlines are much, much sooner 
than the federal deadlines. Um, and it's important to recognize they are setting the priorities, submitting the applications. So it's really important to work with them. And I wanted to take a couple of minutes to, to talk about um, just considerations for how to be successful in this program. This federal program has a 75-25% federal, non-federal uh, cost share. If we're talking about large scale, big complex projects, that comes with a big price tag. And especially after COVID, a lot of our local communities have reduced tax bases, have limited staffing, are, are not quite ready um, to spend or, or execute large scale projects. Um, thankfully in California, we're probably in a little bit better spot than maybe some other areas in Region 9, but I do wanna be considerate of the fact that asking for 25% non-federal cost share is a lot. So some tips for success here are consider creative solutions um, for that, that cost share. It doesn't have to be cash, it doesn't have to be a bond. Um, you could do in-kind services using staff hours and time. You could also, you know, if you have equipment that your city already owns and could calculate how much it would cost to rent it versus what you have, those are things that you can kind of contribute to, to chip in. Also, lean on partnerships. The private sector plays a role in this. Get them involved with your hazard mitigation plan um, update and start to loop them in earlier in the planning process. Maybe they could help chip in somehow. Um, also, the BRIC program really is, and I think this is quite exciting, um, it really leans and, and is prioritizing and funding capability and capacity building activities. Um, so actually throughout this entire morning, we were talking about different outreach, how to be more inclusive and, and do outreach and more community engagement. The BRIC program will fund community planning, not just the update of your plan, but we will fund um, trainings, outreach, workshops, um, figuring out ways to be more inclusive. Um, we'll actually fund different partnership activities. Maybe it's putting together a partnership database or holding a conference or some sort of convening. Um, these are all things that BRIC will fund. Um, also, they'll fund project scoping. So if you've got an idea, but you don't have all the feasibility and like technical kind of components figured out, we'll also fund the scoping of your project as well. Um, so those are things to kind of think towards. Um, and also BRIC gives management costs. So if you need to hire staff to help administer the projects, BRIC can help fund staff time as well. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention for consideration is for, and it's a really nice kind of equity component. If you are in a community that's considered um, a small or impoverished, and there is a specific definition there, um, the cost share will actually go down to 10% non-federal and FEMA will cover 90%. So it's worth investigating. Um, if you are, are categorized as that, um, because it's just another opportunity to spread the dollars a little bit further. A couple of more keys for success. Um, I mentioned this before, FEMA might be the bank, but the states write the checks. So know your state partners, uh, know their processes and their priorities. Um, your best friend should be the state hazard mitigation officer and their staff. And I actually included their email later in this presentation. Keep your plan up to date, use it. Um, you know, don't let that plan just sit on the shelf. Uh, also, front load as much as possible. We know that there's going to be a brick opportunity opening up in a couple of months. Start thinking of your project now. Start pulling together documentation for your benefit cost analysis or environmental and historic preservation um, documentation. And also, you know, as trainings and guides come available, there is a ton, ton of resources out there. So, you know, it's a federal program with, with fun little hoops to jump through. Um, it's really about understanding what you're applying to um, and just being as informed as possible to be successful. I'll make sure that I share this with the, the conference organizers here today, but there's a couple of resources for um, California, for FEMA about BRIC um, and also about nature-based solutions. So I just wanted to share those with you as well. And then the last thing I wanted to touch on is uh, a really cool outreach project that Region 9 has been doing. Our community planners here at FEMA have been partnering with the Georgetown Climate Center to do podcasts. They're quick 10, 15 minute interviews with local practitioners who have actually done mitigation in Region 9. 
Um, most of the examples are from California. Um, some of them are from Arizona or the Pacific. Um, we have a couple of projects that talk about co-benefits, that talk about green infrastructure and things that were considered or um, ways that the community was engaged with in inclusive ways that allowed their projects to be successful. Um, season one was released in uh, summer of last year and season two is actually getting released on Tuesday. So it is right around the corner and we've got a really cool story from actually Arizona about um, uh, green infrastructure for drought and urban heat. So I just wanted to share this with you as well. So with that, I think I got to the end of my slides here and I'm just so grateful for this opportunity and to share this exciting new program with you all. So I'm looking forward to the um, question and answer session here and kind of get more into it with you guys. So thank you. Allison, thank you so much. Uh, fun stuff. Uh, season two on Netflix, right? Uh, I love that. Love that. <laughs> love that name uh, naming convention for that programming. Uh, all right, folks. Uh, thank you, everyone, for hanging in there with us. Uh, we still have a lot of participants on the uh, on the Zoom call here, and we're going to jump into some some Q and A. Allison, I'm going to start uh, with you first, and and this is for all the panelists. But I think it's a it's a very valid question, and it it speaks to coordination. Um, let's just say, as if I'm a city official, right? Municipal. Uh, either I run a department, or I'm the city manager. Um, which agency should a city contact first if they want to find out? uh either funding programs or nature-based solutions you know and i think that's for me just personally i think that is the the confusing goal there's no real roadmap here about where you know what what's the sequential process for a a, a local municipality to to go through and doing some of this work so Allison, not if you want to feel that first that'd be great yeah and i i that's a really good question because it's different in every community because the mandate for mitigation plans comes from FEMA, I would say more often than not, the kind of owner or facilitator of the mitigation plan and, and helps distribute the information about grants will typically come through your emergency services office. Um, sometimes communities actually have an official emergency manager. Other times it might be a fire chief or a police chief who's helping facilitate that. So those are always really good first options. Um, in California, though, because we have um, a Senate bill, which actually requires mitigation plans to be tied to the safety element of the general plan, it'd also be worth reaching out to your city planner, because even if they might actually be writing the mitigation plan, but even if they're not, they're certainly involved with the safety element, which is very closely integrated. Um, so I feel like those are two um, really solid first steps to go towards. Um, and then, you know, you're always welcome to reach out to the state and the planners at the state level um, have a list of contacts for every community. I, I won't say that they're always up to date, but that at least is another kind of resource to go and try and find, you know, who's doing what in your area. Yeah, Jeff, and I'd, I'd like to maybe follow up with, with Allison's um, uh, points there and, and actually turn the question on its head. And, and the question is when to consider nature-based solutions. And I think that should, you know, start to be part of our part of our thought process as we begin to, to adapt to sea level rise and climate change. And uh, I think finding those opportunities are different depending on where you want to implement these, these opportunities. For instance, if you're in an urban landscape and you're doing LID, that's a very different set of folks you would be working with as opposed to horizontal levees on the coastline. Right, so I think if we start with where can we use nature-based solutions, and then go from there to find partnerships with, you know, the experts at SFEI who have done a lot of work to map out where these opportunities are to use tools like the green infrastructure mapping tool um, that that folks around the Bay Area have been working on to find locations where we can drop LID uh, into urban landscapes. Um, I, I think are, are are good ways to go, but considering it. Uh, should should definitely be part of of our our arc as we work to adapt to sea sea level rise and climate change. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna dig into that a, a little bit deeper, um, and may, maybe popping back to Allison or you know obviously any, any panelist who wants to chime in. So, um, what is the level of coordination uh, and 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 Brit 
and municipalities and I mean, you know, I, I almost it almost seems like there's a uh, an Esri opportunity here. Um, but on on multiple levels, right on the funding side, on the project existing project side, on the future project side, on the risk, what's the, you know what's the highest risk level? What are the most vulnerable communities? You know that you know some kind of um, uh, mapping ability to to guide us collectively. And in, in that, that is that still a gap in your mind? Yeah, I think I mean we're we're getting better with that, but it's I agree. The especially right now, it feels like because we've had such um, impactful and overwhelming disasters over the past four or five years, especially in California, it's like I think the 2016 floods and 2017 fires like just kickstarted a nonstop uh, kind of disaster tempo here. Um, there's a lot of, of solutions being thrown at it. So whether that's money, um, I know actually I've heard recently, and I, I don't know the specific details, but California um, is actually going to be um, allocating hundreds of millions of dollars to set up their own mitigation grant program. Um, so that's something, you know, and FEMA, we've got a few, but that doesn't mean other federal agencies don't have it. There's, there's all of these resources, it feels like, coming. And a lot of them have a climate um, focus and with an equity lens, but we don't really know who's gotten what, where, and who needs it the most. Um, so FEMA actually just maybe two, three months ago rolled out what's called a national risk index. Um, it's relative risk and it's a national data set. So I'm not saying it's perfect, but you can zoom in to the census tract level to see areas um, that are at higher risk from different natural hazards and also, um, you know, due to their building codes that are in force or mitigation actions that have happened there already, how at risk they are perceived to be. Um, so that's a way to kind of like hone into different hotspots. Um, and also FEMA is trying to put geospatial attributes onto the work we're doing so we can actually see where we're funding all of these different projects and to see where gaps might be and where to focus kind of outreach. Um, so short answer is yes, there's so much data and I think we need to be smart about how we're using our resources and we're getting there with baby steps, but I don't think there's a, a silver bullet solution here for this. I will definitely add on to that. Um, so I, I just met Allison within the last month, um, on another type of panel discussion like this. Um, so for those of us that have been working in the restoration community for, for decades, um, I, I, FEMA's a newcomer. You know, they aren't the usual suspects. Um, I wrote Allison's contact information down immediately and I still have yet to set up a meeting to talk to her one-on-one. -on -one. It always comes down to people. You have to be able to penetrate into these black box bureaucracies and get the answers that you want. So we've all just met Allison and it's very exciting and we can't wait to have kind of local examples where where someone has pushed through this new process. I will also want to hear the examples from Arizona or elsewhere where you say that you have projects, but I, I'm in this, I'm in the same boat and I'm in this crowded restoration, you know, agency funder world. Um, but I, you know, we work with our usual suspects and, and I think the Bay Area, um, there's a lot of lift, there's a lot of communication back and forth, but there hasn't always been a lot of funding. And now I think as Allison was saying, there, there is new funding um, and it just means opening up the lines of communication even more um, to make sure that, that we, we learn it so that through our partnerships, we can reach back into our disadvantaged communities. Disadvantaged, disadvantaged communities, I'm very sorry to say, you know, they're not gonna access an Esri um, platform to learn how to navigate the horrible strings that come attached with receiving federal and even state funding. Um, right? We need, we need translators. We need people who have invested in those communities that, that serve, you know, them um, by, by making our processes understandable. That's what I would add at this point. It's a fabulous response. Um, James, any, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, you know, getting back to the core question is what does, what does a city staffer or a local person do if they're new to the game? Right. I think we're all stepping into new realms, whether it be environmental justice or nature based solutions. Um, thought is changing very quickly. 
Um, and and what I would say is again, start the conversation around you know what nature-based solutions could we could we employ, right? And who are the partners we can find to help us with that? Right, the San Francisco Estuary Partnership has worked with dozens and dozens of cities and, and other entities and counties and special districts and RCDs um, to in partnership to, to implement projects and to help answer some of these questions, right? Or Loma was one of the projects funded under the Irwin program that was brought up in a previous conversation and, and piloting new technologies to implement across the Bay um, are, are exciting. So for folks that are new to the game, um, as Louisa said, get get to know people, um, you know, step into the community and do so bravely. Um, and we're here and, and, and the community is wanting to embrace those those newcomers. So so definitely find us. And if and if you don't know anybody off the top of your head, Louisa, Allison, James, you know, we're all here. Um, reach out to one of us and we'd be happy to connect you and, and have that conversation. Oh, that's great. Um, uh, I'm going to paraphrase a question from from Tom. Um, we'll start with Louisa. Um, in, in some of the organizations, uh, Luisa specifically uh, for Brit, um, you've got multi-agency uh, participation there as far as the decision-making process. Do you ever run into um, conflicting policy issues and and or priorities amongst your partners? And if so, how do you how does that get resolved? Um, it's a big question with with a variety of answers. So absolutely, policy big. That's why Brit is here um, because we do have policy conflicts. It, it is admitting that that exists. Um, are they easy to resolve? Absolutely not. Um, are we building on success? We certainly hope so. Um, so we have a few examples. Um, filling the bay, huge problem as has already been mentioned by other panelists um, and other forums that you, that you, um, you know, brought to light. Um, we have an advancing sea um, we would need to keep our wetlands from drowning. And yet, if you fill the bay, um, that, that means impact a wetland or a water of the US, um, your project is, is treated in a way that, that increases the cost because you have to mitigate for that. And yet we actually probably need to be incorporating that if we still wanna have wetlands. So th therein lies a rub and there are many of these types of rubs. So BCDC has started looking at its fill policy. The Water Board has started looking at its fill policy to, to address, you know, how, how do we get our laws, our regulations to be current? You know, these are these are laws that were passed decades ago. We had we had different problems then. They certainly didn't envision the problems that we have now. Um, so in some cases, they will need legislative change. Um, in other cases, um, we have things like public access versus uh, endangered species needs, those inherent uh, conflicts within agency mandates. That can often, that's, you know, that's using science. You know, how do we inform ourselves better to make sure that both those needs can be met? And that just means how do we communicate across agencies so that we understand what each other's mandates are? Um, and that we have kind of a couple of those examples with the Brit as well that we've been working on. Um, and we still have some really difficult problems that, that we have not solved yet. So there, there will still be plenty of finger pointing, I'm sure. I hope that's a, a start to an answer of what you just raised. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and, and, and as James said, this is a marathon, right? Uh, we're, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, at least a decadal problem, uh, if not longer than that, right? So it, um, we'll probably outlive relationships and hopefully we're... Uh, we see, see the ground along the way. Um, we've got just a few more minutes. Uh, any closing thoughts from from uh, from any of you as far as what you envision as the next steps here? I can jump in here. I, I would say probably. I mean, the the biggest thing is um, no matter what the funding program is or or what exactly you know what resource you're trying to do. I think the most important thing to focus on now is planning and partnerships, because those are the foundations. You know, I recognize that BRIC has a big price tag with it, but a lot of these activities were fundable under the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. And California in the past like four years has gotten like a billion dollars just for the state. So I don't think money is the issue anymore. It doesn't feel like that, at least to somebody who's helping administer them. <laughs> um, sometimes I wish we had a little bit less, but that's, for later. Um, 
I think the, the foundational things about having strong partnerships, having a plan, doing as, as much documentation and front loading as possible. So whenever the opportunity does arise, you're ready for it. Um, I think we're only going to see more and more resources coming down um, for whether it's nature-based solutions for you know, sea level rise or somebody had asked about wildfire. That is a huge focus in California and for FEMA is to prevent wildfire risk and that post-fire flood uh, risk as well. Uh, just planning and partnerships. Uh, I'll, I'll throw that out there and just being as prepared as we can um, so we can take action when the money comes. Um, I think my my takeaways are, are still, you know, where, where are the communication lines still lagging? Um, I think as um, Jeremy actually earlier today, you know, highlighted Highway 37, you know, our, our integration with our transportation agencies and, and how we view infrastructure, um, they, they still get a pass in, in, an es in essence um, in terms of appropriate uh, planning, you know, as Allison was just saying. Um, and they're, they're not, we don't, we haven't historically integrated well with their planning process and, and vice versa. And, and it's a train wreck and it's coming um, for continuing to see projects that, that are built that probably aren't built for the future that we would like to see in 2050 or 2100. So I think that's a, a huge area that still needs a lot of work. I think the, the issue, the, kind of the arc that bends towards justice related to um, appropriately listening and including disadvantaged communities um, is this decadal um, investment of um, how to make all of our communities feel safe and, and build a future that, um, that has this balance of, of people and nature and that is, that's really hard given the way the Bay Area is built as an urban landscape. Um, those, many, many disadvantaged communities are gonna be hit hard first and we have, and they don't have the resources to do the planning. And so we need folks to step up and get that planning done in, in any way possible, but I don't think that that's been figured out yet. So I, I see that as another huge problem area. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a key point, James. I'll let you close it out. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, I, I would like to riff off of what Louisa had in her last point in that um, disadvantaged, marginalized, underrepresented communities, specifically communities of color, um, have, have been always an afterthought. Um, and that's changing. Um, that's changing in a lot of very significant ways. And I would challenge the participants today in whatever capacity you serve um, to step into that space. It's, it's not a safe space, um, it's, it's a brave space. And it's something as public servants, we need to do and we need to do better. Um, and um, working, and I also wanna uh, include tribes in that as well. Um, tribes have also been an afterthought, a box that are checked on, you know, projects in terms of consultation and things like this. And we should bring these folks to the table before we have 25% designs. Um, and there are entities throughout the Bay Area embedded in communities, as Josh said earlier, that are doing this work and are ready to get involved and can very quickly activate communities and, and, and can um, lean on their previous outreach and, and trust the, these communities to help us achieve those goals. Um, I think there's also a conversation that needs to be had around uh, traditional engineering versus nature-based solutions. I think bringing both groups together to talk about the pros and cons about these approaches is something that, that we need to do. Um, we've relied on traditional engineering for so long. We know it, it's studied, it's, it's utilized across the Bay Area. Nature-based solutions are kind of new and, and I don't wanna say scary, but um, uh, more of an unknown factor for folks. Uh, I think two more points, um, continuing to challenge our regulatory um, agencies to move in the directions that allow nature-based solutions to be implemented in thoughtful manners. Um, we are very lucky in the Bay Area to have regulatory agencies that, that are listening um, and they're showing up and they're changing and they're willing to talk about changing policy and they're documenting what's working and what's not and continuing to have those conversations and showing up to those meetings where regulators are asking, you know, what do you feel about this? What needs to change? What's working? What's not working is really important for all of us to participate in. I think the era of 
um, kind of stepping back and letting you know the the academics or 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 the or or the 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 landscape manager, whoever happens to be embedded in the problem itself or the issue itself or the subject itself handling it are kind of gone. We all need to show up to the table at this point in time. And, and the last thing is, is, is to kind of continue that is we need to pay attention to legislation uh, at the state level and at the local level and enable our elected officials to participate in meaningful ways, to provide them with information um, and to provide them with strategies that they can drop into legislation that will advance these goals, right? They're not, most of them are not experts in, in environment or nature-based solutions, um, but are willing to have those conversations and to change legislation um, to help us achieve our climate change and sea level rise goals. Um, and and I, I wanna leave it with that, that um, legislation is gonna be an incredibly important part when it comes to, to bond funding in California, which is gonna fund a lot of this work into the future. Uh, well, thank, thanks to all three of you for this rich content in the back half of uh, this morning's presentations. Um, I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, uh, James Eggers from the Loma Prieta chapter of the Sierra Club to close it out for us. James. Thank you, Jeff and all um, to colleagues and participants and all who love our bay. Your local Sierra Club chapters have been humbled by the impressive array um, of speakers from agencies and organizations that have agreed to participate because they also recognize the importance of the topic and the need to supply sound, objective, and trustworthy information. We profoundly thank them for their generosity to share their expertise for the benefit of our region and acknowledge them as true local environmental heroes. I offer a special thanks to Speaker Mullen for his contribution to this series and his many important efforts to protect our bay. I also wanna thank all the organizations um, that supported the, this webinar and for their continuing collaboration as we tackle the challenges to protect our bay. And one of my favorite slides showing the impressive array of uh, speakers who contributed to this. I also want to um, say that the entire webinar series, um, these are the organizations that supported this webinar and thank them for their continuing collaboration as we tackle the challenges to protect our bay. And to note that this uh, entire webinar series has been recorded and all the recordings will be available within a few days. You'll be able to find them on each of the three Sierra Club chapter websites, but we will send the links to um, all who have registered. I hope you'll use the recordings as a reference and share them with those um, that you would like to hear and especially with those that should hear. The Loma Prieta chapter is honored to have sponsored this series through our Bay 2030 campaign, made possible through a generous bequest from a longtime local member. And um, here you can see that not only uh, the Loma Prieta chapter, but our chapter, our chapter can't save the Bay alone and could never have organized this series alone. So I sincerely thank the San Francisco Bay chapter, which includes the counties of San Francisco, Marin, Contra Costa, and Alameda and also the Redwood chapter, which includes the Bay adjacent counties of Sonoma, Napa, and Solano, and the Loma Prieta chapter, which includes the uh, San Mateo, Santa Clara, and San Benito counties. Um, I also want to personally thank the individual and uh, nearly indefatigable Sierra Club members who are completely responsible, uh, the volunteers completely responsible for organizing this series. Their time and brilliance for the sake of our Bay inspires me as they build a legacy um, for all of us. Um, at the very beginning of this important webinar series, I opened the first uh, episode. I quoted Sir David Attenborough, whose words are certainly worth repeating because it is particularly relevant to the San Francisco Bay. Sir David has said, what we do now and in the next few years will profoundly affect the next few thousand years. And truly, especially locally, there may have been no other time in human history when so few could do so much to affect so many. This is the legacy that will be left by local elected officials, agency heads and their staff and local activists. So again, I ask what you want your legacy to be. And I hope that this series has helped you to better envision and prepare for your legacy, which can profoundly affect the next few centuries. This is your opportunity to seize the day to protect the Bay. Please do take 30 seconds to help us improve our work by responding to our survey 
after this webinar. And please remember to aprovecha el día para proteger tu bahía. Seize the day to protect your bay. Gracias and thank you.